Welcome to the Johns Hopkins Women's Health Podcast, A Woman's Journey, Insights That Matter. I'm Kelly Gear Ripkin, and I invite you to listen to Johns Hopkins specialists discuss the latest topics in women's health. Now here's your host, Lily Shockney. Hi, this is Lily Shockney from A Woman's Journey at Johns Hopkins, and this is our podcast, Insights That Matter. Today, we are joined by Mona Behuth, who is an assistant professor of neurology. She is also the medical director of the Brain Rescue Unit, and I'm anxious to hear more about that, and a stroke neurologist and researcher who actually specializes in patient-centered approaches to enhancing early stroke recovery. So, Dr. Behuth, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Lily. So according to the CDC, every 40 seconds, someone in the United States has a stroke, which is a leading cause of death in the U.S. and is a major cause of serious disability for adults. So that's about 795,000 people in the United States have a stroke each year. That's a huge, huge number. First of all, Dr. Behuth, what is a stroke and what causes it? And who is primarily at risk for having a stroke? Stroke is a very common and disabling disease. A stroke happens when the brain has a disruption of blood flow of oxygen and nutrients to the brain tissue. So a stroke happens when there is either a blockage of a blood vessel to the brain itself or a break in the blood vessel. Those are ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, respectively. What causes it can be a number of things in terms of risk factors, a clot that moves from one area of the body to another to block the blood vessel. It can be caused by an accumulation of cholesterol plaque that builds up on a blood vessel wall and narrows that blood vessel significantly such that the blood flow is disrupted to that part of the brain. It can happen when there is an aneurysm in the blood vessel of the brain itself, and then the blood vessel is fragile and can leak blood into the brain tissue. In terms of who is at risk for a stroke, there are some modifiable and non-modifiable reasons that patients can have stroke themselves. As we all probably know that as we age, our chance of stroke increases. So especially as we become older than age 55, our stroke risk increases. Some would say that men have higher risk of stroke than women, but the reality is probably in most demographics, they're 50-50. Some women are more at risk for severe strokes than men related to some estrogen shifts in older age. And there are certain races that are more at risk for stroke, african American and Hispanic races are at higher risk for stroke. But when you look at the large population, stroke can happen to anyone at any time. Now, there are some modifiable things, things that we can do to reduce our chance for having a stroke and reduce our risk. And those things are control our high blood pressure. If somebody has high blood pressure, have a healthy diet and exercise. A condition called Atrial fibrillation places someone at high risk for stroke. Atrial fibrillation is a condition of the heart where the heart quivers irregularly in between heartbeats and allows the blood to pool and clot. And atrial fibrillation can be a risk for ischemic stroke. Diabetes or difficulty with sugar control is a risk factor for stroke. Smoking and drug use both place you at high risk for stroke. Some drugs like cocaine are especially place a person at high risk for stroke. There are many others. High cholesterol and kind of low exercise, high fat diets can contribute to your risk for stroke. Are all strokes the same? That's what's so interesting about this disease. A stroke can happen in many ways depending on location. You know, when you're buying a house, people say location, location, location. It really depends on where in the brain the injury happens, to what degree those symptoms will show themselves. Again, it depends on the type of stroke. So if it's a blood vessel causing the bleeding kind of stroke versus a blockage, those can really cause different strokes altogether. So all strokes are definitely not the same depending on the type and the location of where the injury happens. What are the common symptoms of a stroke that our audience needs to be aware of, whether it's happening to them or perhaps they're witnessing happening to a loved one like their spouse? Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up the fact that it could be happening to the person or to someone witnessing it happening to another person because it's so hard to know the symptoms and make that 911 call. So there is an acronym called BFAST, B-E-F-A-S-T, and that really highlights the symptoms of stroke. Sudden change in balance is one symptom of stroke. Sudden change in your eyes, meaning your vision. Sudden loss of vision. Sudden change of vision. The F stands for facial weakness. Sudden drooping of the face where you're looking at someone and suddenly one side of the face looks much flatter than the other. 
arms is what the A stands for. And that is a sudden weakness in the arms where if you were to have someone try to hold up their arms, the arm would drift down towards the ground because of weakness. S stands for speech, sudden change in speech. And so if you have somebody who's suddenly unable to understand you or unable to speak normally, that could be sign of a stroke. Then T means time is of the essence. You need to get to the hospital right away by calling 911. So be fast can really frame the knowledge of what stroke symptoms are. What happens in your brain during a stroke while a stroke is actually occurring? The brain is one of the only organs in the body that requires a constant supply of oxygen and nutrients, glucose, to sustain the cells. And so when a stroke is happening, let's say the blockage of an artery happens, that blood flow is disrupted to part of the brain and the nutrients that really are required of that brain tissue are disrupted from their delivery. Within minutes, brain tissue can start dying because it doesn't have the oxygen and glucose that it requires to sustain itself. And when brain tissue dies, that means the function that that area of the brain used to be responsible for can no longer be sustained in that area. That's what happens at the time of stroke in the brain. The other thing that can happen is when blood is leaking out of a blood vessel and the hemorrhagic type of stroke or the bleeding type, it can actually put unnecessary pressure on normal brain tissue or cause change on the brain tissue itself. Damage from blood can be very abrasive to brain tissue. So those are two ways that the brain gets injured. Some people call it an internal brain injury. How do you go about diagnosing that, yes, this is in fact a stroke? So it's really critical if anybody sees those symptoms of stroke, that sudden weakness, sudden speech problems, sudden vision problems, sudden balance problems, sudden change in sensation, that they bring their loved one right away by 911 to the hospital. Diagnosis of stroke is a clinical one. Doctors and nurses are looking for key signs of stroke. That way we can make the diagnosis clinically. There are also tests like CAT scans that can show us the bleeding kind of stroke, or even in some places, a rapid MRI can show us the ischemic type of stroke rather quickly. But overall, doctors and nurses can know the signs of stroke and diagnose that problem on arrival to the emergency department. And I'm sure doing the imaging studies of the brain is absolutely necessary to rule out that what could be happening might actually be a brain tumor, like a glioblastoma that can produce similar symptoms often because of bleeding, but that that ultimate cause is because of a malignant brain tumor. What you're mentioning there is critical because there are things that can look similar to stroke, but aren't necessarily that. And so that's why we all call 911 and get to the hospital. We'll figure out what's going on. And if it's a treatable condition, we'll get to it. And if it's something else, we'll be able to figure that out. Now, the CAT scan can only show us certain things. And you're right, sometimes we do find brain tumors or other things, but it can show us rather quickly if the brain is having bleeding as the main problem behind the symptoms. How do you go about treating a stroke? And we've been talking about timeliness of call 911 and get your loved one promptly to an emergency room. Are there things that can be done within a specific time frame that can help reverse some of these symptoms versus once you've had these symptoms, you've just got to live with them? We all go by the mantra, time is brain, in that as each passing moment goes by, more than a million neurons are dying minute by minute. And so time is definitely brain. The faster you can get to the hospital where potential treatments are delivered, the better. There are a couple of treatments that we need to talk about. For the ischemic type of stroke, the stroke caused by a blockage, There is a clot-busting medication called tissue plasminogen activator, TPA, and it's a clot-busting medicine that is given through an IV. If you have the type of stroke that is caused by a blockage, you may be eligible for the medication called TPA. It's given through an IV, and the job of the medication is to go in and break up the blood clot that's causing the problem. That medication has to be given within four and a half hours from when the stroke started. So in podcast time where you and I are talking, that seems like forever, but in emergency time where there is a lot to be accomplished, that actually four and a half hours goes by rather quickly. And so the key is if somebody sees someone having a stroke, call 911 quickly so that they can get to the hospital quickly. Now there's another type of procedure for certain stroke types. If the blockage is in what's called a large artery or a large blood vessel, one of the main highways to the brain. And there is a surgical procedure called mechanical thrombectomy. And this you probably have heard is kind of like a heart catheterization where people go into the heart and open up a blood vessel around the heart. This is a procedure where the interventionalist takes a wire, goes up a little bit further to the blocked vessel, and here tries to mechanically pull that blood clot out to restore blood flow to that area of the brain. 
Now we have a longer time window for that procedure, but that's not to say that people should delay getting to the hospital because we know that the best outcomes happen when a patient can receive both of these treatments and only a certain group of patients are eligible for that surgical procedure, the thrombectomy. So again, time is brain getting there quickly and getting the procedure as quickly as possible is important. But in some cases, in some groups, you have up to 24 hours to have that surgery, depending on the blood vessel that's blocked and the type of disruption that it's causing. Can you share with us what's happening in the field of research regarding stroke, some of the innovative things that are being studied right now? When you think about stroke care, you really break up the continuum of work that is being done. It all starts with prevention. If we can prevent any stroke from happening, that would be the best thing ever so that we don't even have to deal with the consequences of stroke. There are many hyperacute studies going on. Can we find new medications and new treatments to open up those blood vessels more efficiently? There is work in the hospital being conducted to say, how can we reduce the chance of disability for all patients, whether or not you receive these emergency treatments or not? How can we reduce the chance of disability from the stroke by intervening early and properly within the first couple of weeks? And of course, there are studies along to the more chronic phase. Once you have these deficits or these disabilities, are there ways to reduce their impact on your quality of life? So I would say across the whole continuum, there is a lot of work being done to try to abolish this terrible disease. At Johns Hopkins, we've been focusing a lot about recovery studies, things that we can do to enhance a person's recovery from their symptoms. There are some medication studies that are ongoing to see if they can help with your language recovery. There are video game technologies being developed at Johns Hopkins to see if we can enhance people's engagement with their therapy and increase the intensity of movements that they need to recover from weakness related to stroke. There are family interventions. Can we help have family members and care partners get involved more quickly and easily with their loved ones so that they can be part of the solution? And of course, there are systems of care procedures going on to say, how can we the healthcare team be with you sort of along this whole continuum from hospital to home to be sure that everything you need is provided as things are adjusting over your recovery period from stroke. We have a lot going on. I probably could talk for days about each of those things. (laughs) You mentioned some of the risk factors for having a stroke, for example, smoking. If someone stops smoking, let's say they've been a smoker for 20 years, and they now say, I am going to do the right thing for myself and for my family. I'm going to stop smoking. Will that reduce their risk of getting a stroke going forward? Some people feel like, oh, you know, I've smoked all my life. What would smoking do for me now? And I'm so glad you brought it up because when you quit smoking, that gives your blood vessel lining a chance to heal and recover. Smoking itself causes a change in the smoothness of the blood vessel wall, meaning that it could be rough and platelets and blood cells can stick to it, causing a blockage. Smoking also causes a narrowing of the blood vessels, meaning it spasms down on itself with every puff of the cigarette with all the chemicals and tobacco that are in cigarettes. When you quit smoking, that allows that blood vessel wall to heal. And over the next couple of years, that blood vessel wall can restore nearly back to its original base. That smoothness of the blood vessel can restore itself. The next thing it does is reduce your chance of having cancer. And so as it relates to stroke, cancer can thicken your blood, which can lead to blockage and and narrow spaces. And so I would encourage anybody who's contemplating quitting smoking to go for it because it will have significant benefit to reduce your chance of both of these types of strokes. I think oftentimes we just think about smoking and lung cancer. That's why I wanted to bring it up so that our audience could understand that what it does to the blood vessels is quite significant. Do we know yet whether or not vaping also has the same impact on blood vessels? We don't have as much data about vaping just yet, but I think on principle alone, you have to consider that anything that has any degree of chemical that is being inhaled into the lungs cannot have a good effect. And so I do not say to any patients that vaping would be an alternative to smoking. We have many ways to help people quit the addiction of smoking, which can be difficult, but can be accomplished. We have a lot of healthier tools that can help the person get over that addiction. And I would not say that vaping should be used as an alternative to smoking. I have encouraged my friends that have agreed to do their very best to stop smoking to take the money that they spend on cigarettes each week and put it in a jar and label the jar how they want to spend that money. Most of them are doing a vacation somewhere. They now have money for a vacation when they didn't before. 
they're going to feel healthier going on that vacation than they did before. So redirecting that yeah. money is a good incentive, I think, to help them do the right thing for themselves. And I also say for the family too, because I'm a believer in secondary smoke is not helpful for any of us. You're the right kind of friend to have because motivation is half of the battle, especially women. Many times women don't care for their health properly because you're so busy caregiving for many other family members. And so they put their own needs to the side. But with your kind of ideas of how to motivate for sort of a family gift or a family trip or something, that could be a great incentive. But also that idea of secondhand smoke being unhealthy to everybody around that most certainly affects children and their blood vessels. And so I think reducing that secondhand smoke to your loved ones is also a benefit of quitting smoking. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So heart disease accounts for one in every four deaths and is the leading cause of death for women in the United States. I also heard that heart disease and stroke is on the rise in younger women. What accounts for that? It's hard to know what the exact etiology is behind this younger women in stroke. There have been many gains in terms of our diagnosing of stroke and heart disease earlier for both men and women. But I think that the American Heart Association has done a great job to really let people know what are some unusual signs and symptoms of heart attack and stroke so that people can be seen by their doctors sooner before that catastrophic vascular event happens. And so I do think that people are paying attention more to the symptoms of these diseases. And I think they're getting to healthcare more often earlier as needed. But I I think the same risk factors do exist for both heart disease and stroke in terms of reasons people develop this disease. Do you think that because we as women do have a tendency to delay taking care of ourselves because we're busy taking care of everybody else in our family is a contributor to individuals who have a stroke probably dying of a stroke because they're not calling 911, they're going to keep fixing dinner? I don't often make generalizations really because the same problems can exist for men and women, but it is a very important thing to know that whoever your loved one is or a care partner or someone in the house with you may have to be the one to call 911. And so education about all of these issues should be to everybody in the house so that that difficult 911 call can be made. Sometimes we say women have different symptoms of heart attack. They don't often feel that crushing chest pain and classic pain to the left arm and pain to the jaw, there may be more subtle symptoms of nausea or symptoms that people may ignore altogether. And when it comes to signs of a stroke, you may not be able to get to the phone to call 911. So educating the people around you that I could be high risk and I would need you to call 911 for, for me if this happened is part of the equation of getting people to the hospital quicker. And so, of course, we want everybody to live their best life and as well as possible and reducing the risk for heart disease and stroke are key, but also educating people that if that moment comes, that here are the actions I would hope you would take on my behalf. We know that from a medical perspective, doctors also refer to a stroke as a CVA, cerebral vascular accident. I think it would be worthy for us to speak a moment about a TIA, transient ischemic attack, and what those symptoms are like and what warning is that giving the individual who's experiencing those symptoms? That term CVA, cerebrovascular accident, is actually going by the wayside. We're trying not to use that as much anymore because we know the reasons people have stroke. We know the risk factors. We know mechanically what's going on. And so we're trying to really stick with the terminology of stroke or brain attack even. But I'm so glad that we're talking about stroke as a whole and when we talk about stroke, we cannot help but talk about TIA, transient ischemic attack. Some people call that a mini stroke, meaning that the symptoms came for a few minutes and then went away completely. But TIA is actually your warning sign to get some help, get evaluated quickly to see if there's anything we can do to reduce that chance of that major stroke. So a TIA is just a few minutes that look just like stroke, sudden weakness, sudden numbness, sudden change in sudden language change that comes on quickly and goes away just as quickly. And because it's a painless process, many people choose to ignore that warning sign. But within the first seven days after a TIA is the highest risk of a major stroke happening. So if I right now, Lily, had sudden loss of vision in one eye, you would have to tell me, let's check this out because this could be your chance to have a blood vessel that is nearly blocked open or be placed on a medication to reduce your chance of stroke. 
just because I say, oh, I'm feeling fine now, you shouldn't ignore it because that is your chance to work within a window of opportunity to prevent the stroke from happening in itself. So TIA is critical to pay attention to almost equally to the stroke symptoms, get to the hospital for evaluation. Can we talk now more about higher stroke risk in women? And I would like you to discuss a couple of specifics associated with that. For example, pregnancy. Pregnancy is a unique condition uh, to women and a time that is a higher risk for stroke. During pregnancy, women can have what's called a hyperviscous state, meaning the blood is thicker or prone to clotting more often. Also, there are a lot of fluid shifts during pregnancy that cause a lot of changes in how the blood is circulating during a time of pregnancy. So pregnant women and during the first few weeks after pregnancy are a high risk for stroke and somebody without traditional risk factors. These kind of strokes can happen in a couple of different ways. We've talked a lot about the arteries, the main blood vessels that bring things to the brain. But in pregnancy, you can also get a blockage of the veins that drain blood away from the vein that can cause its own set of stroke-like problems. Pregnancy is definitely a key time for increased stroke, and we are always on high alert when somebody who is pregnant has sudden symptoms of weakness, numbness, language problems, or vision change. And preeclampsia, which also is related to pregnancy. Can you speak about that a moment? The phrase eclampsia has to do with a series of symptoms that can happen around pregnancy, but related to stroke, the number one feature is a volatile blood pressure, a blood pressure that is very high. And when the blood pressure is unduly high, lead to bleeding in the brain, the bleeding kind of stroke, or it can lead to ischemic stroke just by the fact that it places undue pressure on the blood vessels itself. So preeclampsia, meaning a chance for us to really note high blood pressure and treat high blood pressure would be a way to reduce stroke for pregnant women. So birth control pills have been available and in use for many decades. I know if we go back half a century ago, they were pretty high doses and today they're a far lower dose, but could they actually contribute to someone having a stroke? When we think about birth control or oral contraceptive pills, There are a wide variety of choices that women can make regarding their birth control options. So I would say that if a woman is interested in birth control pills, they should really speak with their GYN doctor closely or GYN provider. Now, if a person has high risk factors for stroke, then a provider will obviously make some considerations for that. So if a woman has high blood pressure, atrial fibrillation, diabetes, you may choose a different option than someone who doesn't have those risk factors. And there have been a lot of advances in terms of birth control pills as well that does leave the woman many choices that way. But I will say that in combination that still requires attention is if a woman is smoking and taking birth control, that chance for a stroke remains incredibly high. And so that combination can be quite deadly. I would instruct most women who are smoking and considering birth control really stop smoking before they start their birth control pills because that combination can lead to stroke more often and is quite a deadly combination. Good advice. And how about hormone replacement therapy? Sure. So now we move to the postmenopausal time period where hormone replacement therapy might be one option for women to help with symptom management and other issues. And again, this is a great time for a discussion with a GYN provider to say, what is my risk profile? What are my stroke risk factors? And how should I decide whether or not to use these hormone replacement therapies? Now, there has been a lot of research in this area. And we know that women who have had stroke or at very high risk for stroke should not take hormone replacement therapy unless a significant condition or other risk prevails. So again, this is a perfect time to speak with both your neurology provider and your GYN provider to be sure that the right balance is selected for you. But in general, you would say hormone replacement therapy for women with stroke or at high risk for stroke, we don't suggest it. What about migraines with an aura? This is another way that women sometimes can have more risk for stroke than men. There is an accumulating body of literature that shows that anybody who has migraine with aura, but we know that's a more often syndrome in women, can be at higher risk for stroke, especially if there is a combination with a condition called patent foramen ovale, PFO. So if someone has migraine with aura and one of these PFOs, patent foramen ovale, that can increase your risk for stroke even without any other risk factors for stroke itself. So someone with migraine with aura in a high family history of stroke should consider talking to their provider carefully and helping to identify whether or not they have this underlying condition. Now, a patent foramen ovale is really just a communication between two sides of the heart. It usually closes at birth, but in a large percentage of people, that remains open. And so for people with migraine with aura or frequent clotting conditions in the leg, this could be an increased stroke risk if you have this patent foramen ovale. 
if you were with someone and they are having signs and symptoms that they're probably having a stroke, we talked about calling 911 right away, no matter where we are, if we're in a theme park or if we're home in our kitchen. Is there anything else that should be done by a family member before the ambulance arrives? Basically, the best thing to do is call 911. Just laying that person flat so that they don't fall and injure themselves would be the best thing that you could do. If the person is vomiting or having any other issues that may lead to aspiration or choking, turning that person on their side is great. But there isn't anything else that should be done. Some people ask me the question of, should I have given my dad an aspirin or should I have done anything else at that time? And the answer is no. The reason for that is you don't know what kind of stroke your loved one is having. So if you give an aspirin that thins the blood slightly and it's out to be a bleeding stroke, then that would not have been the helpful solution. So the best thing you can do is make that brave call, call 911, make sure that person around you is safe in terms of falling. And then hopefully, and we're spoiled here in the U.S., hopefully that EMS will arrive quickly so that your loved one can be taken to the closest hospital. I know that when someone is seeing, for example, a new primary care physician and they're gathering a medical history and family history, if let's say a woman's dad had died of a stroke when he was 56, does this increase her risk of also having a stroke? Is there a genetic link or is it lifestyle behaviors that may get passed down from generation to generation that increases risk? Whenever we see a family member who's had a stroke around age 50 or before age 50, it raises our concern that perhaps there's a genetic problem of clotting. So there are some genetic issues that lead to blood clotting more abnormally than usual. You see multiple family members with blood clots in their legs or their lungs or the brain like stroke, then we may explore for the family members whether or not they have a clotting disorder like that loved one. Now, if your family members all had stroke diabetes, now that's probably more lifestyle management of high blood pressure and diet and exercise and cholesterol management. It's really the stroke in the young that raises the antenna of perhaps there's a familial issue going on. There are also familial hypercholesterolemias, high cholesterol syndromes that run in families. And so if you know of a family member who has supremely high cholesterol, you might want to be checked earlier yourself to be sure that you're ahead of the curve in terms of controlling high cholesterol. And then finally, there are aneurysms that can run in families. So if you have a primary loved one, like a mother, father, sister, or brother, who's had an aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, a type of bleeding stroke in the brain, then perhaps your primary provider will want to check you for aneurysm as well, because those can run in the family. And that doesn't mean like a grandmother, you know, four degrees removed, that really means a primary relative, sort of mother, father, sibling. And the method of going about determining if there is a cerebral aneurysm in the brain, what would that be? Fortunately, our technology has come a long way in terms of uh, being able to have a CAT scan that looks at the blood vessel wall itself. So it used to be that back in the day, you'd have to have an invasive procedure like an angiogram with a wire catheter. But more recently, a CT scan that focuses on the blood vessel themselves could be sufficient. That's great because whatever we can do to uh, head those off at the pass, right? Take care of it before it decides that it's going to leak or going to pop. I've always... uh, consider the cerebral aneurysms like a bubble on a tire that you might drive your car on that tire for 80,000 miles and nothing goes wrong. And then you go one more mile and bang, that bubble will pop. So whatever we can do to prevent bubble popping sounds like a good idea. (laughs) Bubble popping. I'm going to have to put that one away. But yeah, (laughs) no, we can do to prevent the devastation from bleeding kinds of stroke or the blood vessel blockage is definitely worth our effort. Are there any symptoms of a stroke that are unique just to women? I think I've read a lot of papers that suggest that perhaps there could be unique symptoms, but I would say that the traditional symptoms are really the ones to know for both men and women. The fact that the symptoms come on very quickly, so sudden is a key word when it comes to stroke, meaning that one second the person is doing fine and then the next second they're completely weak on one side. Sudden numbness, meaning you cannot feel one side of your body, sudden loss of vision, sudden trouble speaking or understanding the spoken word. Those are really the typical ones. There are not really 
classic symptoms that only affect women. You know, when we talk about heart disease, that's when we talk about different symptoms that women might have as related to MI or myocardial infarction. But I think the stroke symptoms are all classically similar. Some people have shown me reports, well, women more often get hiccups. The hiccups actually can happen because of the part of the brain that's injured by the stroke, not necessarily that it was a woman or a man. And so I just always try to tell people, stick with the classics. When you see those symptoms that we just talked about, those are signs of stroke. Call 911, whoever it is that can get to the phone first should make that call. Then we hope that everybody gets the treatment they need. I'd like to close in talking a little bit about the brain rescue unit for which you are the medical director. Is this located at Johns Hopkins Hospital or at Johns Hopkins Bayview? Where is it geographically and what happens there? The Brain Rescue Unit is at the Johns Hopkins Hospital downtown. We are one of a handful of comprehensive stroke centers in the state of Maryland, meaning that our facility has the capability to treat all kinds of stroke, whether it needs surgery or medicine at any time of the day. The Brain Rescue Unit is a very unique place in that we also focus very heavily on things that we can do for all patients to get them jump-started in terms of their recovery activities. So in the Brain Rescue Unit, your loved one will be treated by specialist nursing who are very, very familiar with the ups and downs of early stroke care. You will see therapists two hours, up to three hours per day from the very first day that you land in the hospital, meaning we start recovery activities right away. We have integrated video game technology to help motivate patients to sort of engage with their therapies earlier and with more intensity. And so here we have our engineering group created some excellent video games. The Kata group, one is a dolphin that really engages with you as your friend and partner in your recovery to help you work on your arm strength. We also have many tools that we use to help people get up and moving earlier in the brain rescue unit. If you had gone to the hospital, let's say even 20 or 30 years ago, people would say, oh, the stroke patients are too sick. They should stay in bed. Well, now we know that staying in bed can cause many more issues. So we have all the tools that we need to get people upright as early as possible and out of bed and moving. And before the COVID pandemic, we had a lot of family integration. We had a place where people could have a social space together where they could eat together, that that feeling of isolation that comes with stroke could be overcome with some social engagement. So I like to say the Brain Rescue Unit really focuses on everything we can do to get a person better more swiftly. We like to start it as early as possible with the right dose at the right time. And I think we're moving in the right direction in terms of trying to beat this terrible disease and reduce this disability related to stroke. I know we're working hard to find better answers and do research in the Brain Rescue Unit to also make sure that every patient has a much better outcome after this terrible disease. That is wonderful. And the multidisciplinary team Being able to be very patient-centered sounds absolutely perfect, and congratulations on serving in the role as the medical director of that unit. I want to thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Behuth, and is there anything else that I've left out that we should also inform our listeners about? Thanks, Lily, for having me. It's been a treat. The more we can share education about this disease, the more we can work together to find solutions. And I would just say that the real bottom line is it's a disease that we can do something about. So if someone sees those symptoms, we talked about a few times, get to the hospital. It's not hopeless. We can really help you get through this, both you and your loved one, through both medications, surgeries, and the right interventions at the right time to help you come through this. And as much as you can prevent this from happening, please do. But then if the moment strikes that someone needs help, please come on and get to the hospital. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to A Woman's Journey podcast. Join me, Kelly Gear Ripkin, your host, Lily Shockney, and a variety of Johns Hopkins experts on the first Thursday of each month to learn about medical advances in women's health. A Woman's Journey is grateful for the unrestricted educational grants from HRH Foundation that supports our podcast series, Insights That Matter. For more information about A Woman's Journey's virtual programs occurring throughout the year and our monthly webcasts and podcasts, visit our website, hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Like us on Facebook and Twitter and visit our website at hopkinsmedicine.org slash a woman's journey. Until next time, stay well.